I'm Susan Wise Bauer, co author of The Well Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. Today, we are excited to be joined by Keith Nix, the head of school for Veritas Classical School in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Keith. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, a privilege. I've been uh, a fan of Susan for a long time and was influenced by her in my early days and getting into classical education. So this is a real privilege uh, for me, even though we're only 45 minutes away from each other. I, I know. Seen and we've seen each other once in the last 15 years, right, Keith? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> once or twice. So uh, I serve as, as the head of school at Veritas in Richmond, Virginia. I've been here 13 years. Prior to that, I was the head of school in Birmingham, Alabama at the Westminster School. I became the accidental head of school after a group of families founded a young school. And uh, eventually we needed a head of school after four or five years of operating. So uh, I'm the accidental headmaster or head of school, but I've been doing it almost 20 years now. Moving into academia later in life, so to speak, uh, I've, I've been very passionate about the growth of classical education for one, but also leadership development. So mm-hmm. I've served as on the board of the Society for Classical Learning, chaired that board in the past. I work with CLT on, on their board of academic advisors, the Classic Learning Test, have served with ACCS on the board, and really excited about a current project as co-director of a master's program we've developed in conjunction with Gordon College to train classical school heads and classical school leaders. So run a local school here in Richmond, Virginia, but really involved I would say the other thing that I care a lot about that we might get into a little bit later, I I care about helping schools thrive across the country. So Mm -hmm. I work with boards and heads a lot, coaching and consulting, trying to get all kinds of classical schools to a place of health and sustainability and flourishing. I like the accidental. I feel like I feel like I, I always say that I'm an accidental homeschool guru. Um, so I, I'm feeling your, your learning on the job vibe there. Right. And I, I thought it would be fun since on this season, we were really focused on classical education. And today we have with us Keith Nix, who has been a head of two classical schools and, uh, Susan Weisbauer, who has also been in classical education, written a book about it, homeschooled her own children using classical education. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of look at it from two different angles today, the pros and cons of the classical education from, a homeschool perspective versus uh, from in a school. So why don't we start with what are some differences between classical education in a homeschool setting versus classical education in an institutional setting? Yeah, well, I'll jump in and talk about uh, talk about homeschooling uh, just to start out with. Of course, there are the there are the pros that any homeschooling method, not just classical education, but any homeschooling method gives you, which is time with your family. You know, whoever is with your child for I think you said twelve hundred hours. Something like that, Susanna, is the normal normal K through 12 experience. Um, that's when your kid is in school. You get those 1,200 hours with your kid. More control over your schedule, more flexibility, more, uh, more protection in terms of exposure to peer groups, you know, not in an overprotective or isolating or, or creepy way, but just in a, in a wise way, mm-hmm. protecting your child. And I think then in terms of classical education more specifically, um, home education does give you a chance to work with a child who is on a number of different levels simultaneously or who mm-hmm. is not on the standard pattern of elementary, middle, high school. Mm-hmm. Um, a kid who either needs a little more time or is a little bit more advanced or, as we've talked to so, so many parents, it's very typical for kids to be working like on a third grade level in one area and a sixth grade level in another. So when you're doing the classical pattern at home, you can adjust and do grammar stage teaching in one subject, logic stage teaching in another. So it is a little easier, I feel like, to guide children through the stages of classical education when you're working in them um, one-on-one. And Keith, I'm sure that that's also something that you think about in the classroom. We, we do think about it in the classroom. It's just, it's just easier to do uh, at home than in an, in an institution. Different si- Even with schools that are brick and mortar, you have different sizes, different levels of resourcing, so that's a it's a big spe- spectrum, but you we care about it. You have to think about it, but the, we have greater limits, I would say, than you than you would get at home. Keith, I, I'm really curious that it's, it's I mean it's good to hear, and and you know even though I have I am not 
involved in a bricks and mortar school. I actually do a fair amount of teacher training at bricks and mortar schools. And I'm curious as to what you would think of as a good class size that would allow teachers flexibility in working with the kids who are moving through the stages at different rates? Or does it have more to do with the with the resources in the school? What, what would you say would help a school to be flexible in that way? Well, you make a good point because I think you covered two ways to slice that. One way one way to slice it would be to have real small classes, 12 or 14, mm-hmm. which is economically challenging. Our numbers end up being 16 is our ideal. 17 is normal for us. That's our average across the board. Right. Some classes get to 18. I think doing the level of shepherding, both at a not just at an academic level, but as you're shepherding the hearts of the students as well, 14 feels pretty different to most teachers than 18. If you're on the larger side, I do think you have to think about aids and resources. So for us, Mm -hmm. we have an academic support program. And so students, we have a pretty strong capacity to pull out students and give them extra help when it's needed. That that lightens the load of the teacher being an expert at, at managing multiple levels especially when that disparity is a little bit more significant. Uh, But you could slice it by having a really small classroom, (laughs) but that's uh, the finances on that become difficult. So every school has got to find their, find their way in that, in that regard. Yeah. You should never forget. And, you know, I, I also own Well-Trained Mind Academy, which is an online school providing really good uh, classical liberal arts teaching, um, in relatively small classrooms, one-on-one with live teaching. And at the academy, we see these same economics. You have to pay teachers well. You can't (laughs) <laughs> you can't you can't balance the books by chiseling your teachers. So mm-hmm. class size is, you, you know, your number one consideration when you're looking at balancing that budget out and making sure that your teachers are paid what they're worth. The, yep. And that's a that's a soapbox of mine. You, you, you have three levers. Um, you can decide class size as a school. You can decide compensation. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are those are the two biggest levers. People say, well, I can raise money, too. Uh, not not really. So it's tuition, compensation, and class size. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do we charge? What do we pay teachers? And how big are our classes? And if you don't balance your books, if you can't make your finances work, uh, and you have some magical, somebody's going to rescue me, or so, or we're going to nickel and dime, we're going to do 10 fundraisers selling candy and wrappers to try to balance the budget. It, it's just a bad, it's just a bad model. We have to pay teachers well, so we have to set tuition mm-hmm. correctly. And we probably mean that probably means we make we have class sizes that are a little bit bigger than Mm -hmm. what we would dream in a perfect scenario. Yeah. Well, and and I know we're getting off on a rabbit trail here, but we'll get we'll get back to our we do have an outline, folks, in case you're wondering. We'll get back (laughs) to it in a minute. Um, And and the truth is, Keith, that, that unless you have an endowment, fundraisers don't allow you to plan for the future. They might help with a one time cost and expansion or a playground or, or equipment or something like that. But that's not something you can depend on to compensate your teachers. It's just not reliable. No, you're exactly right. That would be the fourth. The fourth way you solve the problem is creating an endowment large enough that it throws off enough income, <laughs> produces enough income, mm-hmm. to really subsidize tuition. That's it's really the only viable uh, viable way to subsidize tuition or to, to keep tuition lower than it otherwise needs to be to pay your teachers well and have the class size you want. But young school, we're a young movement. Classical schools are young, so a lot of us are just getting into the in that endowment stage. I do think there's a big opportunity in the world today as people are becoming dissatisfied with where they've been giving large amounts of money historically within to institutions. So I am really hopeful mm-hmm. about the ability to capture large gifts to grow classical schools. And I do think growing endowments, because the other thing where where a school can get where tuition can get away from a brick and mortar school is operations of facilities. So those are the two mm-hmm. places where endowments can really uh, mitigate rising tuition costs is being able to offset the operations of of mm-hmm. your uh, of your buildings as well as uh, tuition. Look out for an email from Veritas Classical School suggesting <laughs> right. that you look at your estate planning in your email box soon. Well, those, um, those numbers are still sound like in the dream zone for me because I'm coming from a public school background where my first year my homeroom class had 49 students in it, the 49 whoa. eighth graders. Uh, um, granted, it was online, so they were just 
you know, teachers were quitting and more and more kids were being thrown into our class, but it was still insane. So mm. 18, it sounds like, oh, you I make know. me want to jump back into the classroom. <laughs> no, Susanna, you can't do that. I'm sorry. Uh, we need you here. I, I remember my mother saying she taught she taught public school for a, a number of years that when she was in New Orleans, she had 40 second graders yeah. all day long without a break wow. and without a teacher's <sighs> aid. And, yeah. you know, and in New Orleans, by March, it's too hot to have recess outside. So, yeah. oh, man. Uh, you know, just what a challenge that was. So we're going to actually come back to this as we wrap up, if we ever wrap mm-hmm. this up. It, we're going to talk about, you know, if you're looking at a classical school, what is something that you should look at? So, Keith, it sounds to me like one of the questions you might ask is about class size, but that Another one you might ask is for, you know, for larger classes, what sort of individual planning, what sort of individual support is available for students who may be on a slightly different developmental path? Absolutely. The I think part of what families are looking for, even if a family hasn't decided to homeschool, families that are oriented and drawn toward classical Christian education do want to be together as families. So mm-hmm. what we try to do is keep, we say we're a, fa- we're a school for families. We try to keep families together. Mm-hmm. Well, if a given family has more than one kid, two, if they have three for sure, or four guaranteed, they're going to have some academic bumps in the road. So right. we, we started working about a decade ago on building a plan where, where we could, to the best of our ability, keep all of our families together. It's mm-hmm. been wildly successful. And it's not perfect, but wildly successful. And it took learning from a number of schools. Not too many were doing it at that time, but we started looking and learning, traveling, visiting places. And, and almost, we call our program the Scholar Studio. We want to communicate that they're scholars. It's not, it's not, it's just a place that uh, scholars go for extra help. Some might need that extra help a couple of hours a week. Some may need it for a while for two three hours a day. And we grew into it slowly. One person originally, now we have four people really running kind of in that program with a director. But I would ask the question for sure, what's your plan? How do you support mm-hmm. students students who aren't in that middle 80%? How do the high achievers and high flyers get some extra help? Because it's not just mm-hmm. do more, give them more homework or work harder. That's terrible. But how do you enrich those that can do more? And then how do you support those that are going to hit hit some bumps along the way. I definitely want to know what a school did in that regard. Well, and I would say that if you ask that question and they can't articulate it, that would be a little Mm -hmm. bit of a a warning sign, a little bit of a red flag. Yeah. Right. So so when we originally set this up, you know, we were going to talk about pros and cons of classical education at home, pros and cons of classical education in a school setting. And I think I'd rather talk about pros and challenges. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what you're expressing there is one of the challenges for a classical school is sort of this this shepherding thing, this this figuring out how to guide students in the right direction. So it's not a con. It's just something that's a little bit it takes a little bit more thought and strategic planning. And I mean, I would say the same thing if you're if you're doing classical education at home, obviously, you're going to run into the challenge of teaching those subjects that you don't feel particularly qualified in. You know, so much of classical education is about discipleship and the teacher leading the student into knowledge. And how do you do that when you really don't have any idea what you're talking about? So, you know, that's a challenge that as home educators, we've got to really be strategic about and for you, Keith, in your school setting, the sounds like one of the bigger challenges is this individualized shepherding of students. So what would you say are some of the other challenges that you might face? And then what you see as the pros, we'll call yeah. it, we'll keep calling them pros. Yeah. So some of the challenges, and they're easy to identify because they're so much of what we're doing as an institution is mitigating against those challenges every day. So it's easy. There are things that it are easy to be true if you're not really working hard at them. For example, mm. in a typical school setting with multiple subjects, disciplines that you're trying to teach at the same time, each teacher doing their own thing, workload can get hard to manage. The uh, busyness of the school day schedule, the bi- uh, potential mm-hmm. the busyness of after school activities, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to imagine uh, students that are just it's way too busy to, to have a well-ordered mm-hmm. life. And so that's op- that's mm-hmm. operating against the very thing we're trying to do, this idea of a, this idea of a well-ordered life, ordering loves. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to work hard. We, we do a lot to try to keep families from running all over town, for example. We have after-school mm-hmm. programs mm-hmm. 
that are designed to be the kinds of things parents are going to be driving around to get for their kids if they don't get it here. Piano lessons, athletic opportunities, uh, extended more enrichment in the arts. So the the fine arts, the visual arts, the uh, performing arts are big for us. We do a lot in our curriculum, but we offer things. But we try to do that right after school so that the parents can come in the morning and pick up afterwards, not doing multiple trips, and in their day early enough so that they can have dinner around the table, discussing what book they're all reading, getting off their screens. <laughs> we're trying to, we're, yeah. we're, we're working hard to mitigate a, uh, against what would actually be pretty natural, where families are just scattered because they're so busy. It's easy if you're taking up eight to three every day on just the school part to try to cram everything in. So that's one of the challenges we face. Also, as I mentioned earlier, culturally, the bigger the school gets, the harder it is to, you have to make, you have to keep making your school small in a way to mm-hmm. where everyone, mm-hmm. where everyone is known. Homeschool families don't w- worry about their kids being known. Right. <laughs> right. Now, Keith, Veritas is, where does Veritas fall on the scale of small to large? What would you think of as the scale of small to large in terms of a classical school? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've, I've developed, after visiting tons and tons of schools, I've developed an opinion that I think the sweet spot for most classical schools, balancing out economic flourishing with culture, with cultural shepherding and management is, is two sections per grade, which ends up being about a middle-sized classical school of 400. It could be 380, okay. it could be 420. Just whatever your class size is times two times 13 generally is the math. Mm-hmm. That's what we thought Veritas would be. But when we moved to this campus and we had such demand, we are a three section. So we are, we are 50 students per grade K to 12. So we're 675. That's on the large side. There are only a couple of schools out there that I think are four sections per grade. I wouldn't want it for a million bucks or, I would, well, mm-hmm. yeah, it wouldn't be close. I wouldn't want it for $50 million, I don't think. But single section schools. have a great school, endowment, though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Single section schools are hard, too. So a school that's just got one first grade, one second, one third, you get an ebb and flow in enrollment, mm. you can financially, can, mm. it's just difficult. And it's difficult to fill out some of the co-curricular things that you like, that you think enhance your program, but you just don't have enough students for a mock trial team or a basketball right. team. So we're on the larger size. I, I tell most schools that aiming for that two sections per grade, a 400 student body, where you have a couple of hundred students in the lower and a couple of hundred students in the upper is a really good place to be able to flourish institutionally, but also to know every student. The knowing every student part gets tough for us at this size. You know, this is this is something else to put in our, you know, what do you look for if you're thinking of putting your kid in a classical school? I really like this this concept of, you know, you've got to make sure that your child is known because, of mm-hmm. course, one of the challenges as a homeschooler is that you don't have easy access to teams. You don't have easy access to debate. You don't have easy access to music and art and those things that are harder to do in the home. So if you if you look at a bigger school, you might look at all of these different opportunities and be sort of dazzled by them and think, look at all the different things that my kid could do. But you you want to make sure that your child stays known, Mm -hmm. particularly coming out of a homeschool setting. Yeah, absolutely. And schools, if you're in that move and you you want to ask about that and you want to see the school answer that question really, uh, really thoughtfully, uh, if they say, oh, they'll be fine, (laughs) that Mm -hmm. would be a red flag. Say, oh, no, we know how hard it can be. We are really attentive to new students. I would want to hear about that. Well, tell me what that looks like, because it's easy to say they'll be fine. We love new students. It's harder to do. How do they not slip slip through the cracks? We have two new juniors this year. We had our junior trip out west for 10 days to Zion, Bryce, and the Grand Canyon. And we did it a little bit earlier because we had to. But we were very attentive to two or maybe even three new students in that class in a way. It was just it was very much front of mind for my administrative team, all the chaperones, the way we were structuring it. They were letting me know how that was going on the trip. It it Mm -hmm. was just very intentional. We're paying attention to the new students. So I would I would definitely Mm -hmm. ask what that looks like and how thoughtful they are about it, because it's uh, there. There's an academic piece, but there's also a being known, a cultural making friends piece that's really, really important to be aware of if you're a parent doing that. 
Well, that's yeah. what that's what prepares the space within which children can learn. They can't learn if they're anxious, if they're afraid, if they're lonely, if they're a, not sure that the teacher knows their name. Um, you know, so it sounds yep. to me like there could be some useful questions as well from the parenting side that a parent could ask a child in a non-threatening way, you know, casually over ice cream. So um, what's your teacher's name? Does you know, is there a way? I don't know. Is there a way to ask a kid, does your teacher know who you are? Because I think that's actually a really good question. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I think sort of say, does your teacher know who you are probably isn't going to going to be the way to do it. No, but asking them if they feel known is a is a big one. And uh, we do a student culture survey every October and it gets at some of those questions about being known, being respected, a predictable and supportive environment. It's getting at some of those elements, that context that, that to your point, Susan, is 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 this a setting in which learning can go on? Or are there so many other insecurities or distractions or challenges that that a learning the, the learning process that you want is is mitigated or, or hurt in ways that aren't necessary? But yeah, I think that's a good question. If I was a family looking at a school, I would say, can I talk to a family that was new last year and get a mm. get it up and get an idea of how their experience uh, went? And maybe it's a couple of families. Because even when everyone's working together, parents, school, teachers, and administration, it still doesn't always work. Um, mm. There are no guarantees. Transitions right. are tough. Yeah. Transitions yeah. are tough. I wonder if, you know, what this makes me think of is as we were preparing for this um, podcast, we were talking about, you know, things that you're passionate about and talking about creating these student, these spaces where students feel known. Um, one thing that came through that, you're very passionate about Keith and and have worked hard towards is making classical education accessible to more families and to more students. And I think this kind of feeds a little bit into that conversation. So I wonder if we can transition here a little bit to those factors of what schools can do for new families or what schools need to be working towards to be more accessible and making classical education more accessible for more families. Yeah. I think about it two ways. I think about making classical education more available across the nation, across mm -hmm. the world. And I'll answer that one second. The first way that I think about it is what am I doing at my school? What do, what have mm -hmm. I faced? Because we part of me moving to Richmond, Virginia, from Birmingham, Alabama, was the vision and the possibility of a school that looked more like the kingdom of God more broadly, or look more like the demographic of the city of Richmond, right? Mm -hmm. So that was on my heart. Our, we were at a location that made that a little bit difficult, but in God's providence, we end up on this beautiful campus on the historic north side of Richmond, a mile and a half north from downtown, very much in the city, very much at the crossroads of beauty and brokenness, I like to say, where all the where all the good stuff happens. Uh, we have a beautiful and, and I should I should I should just put in, sorry to interrupt you, but as you're talking about this, I just think it's people maybe important for people to know a little bit about Richmond. So Richmond is Richmond is a half and half city demographically. It's it's white and black. That's it. I mean, there's a there's a very small American Indian population, but that is actually mostly out in the rural areas surrounding Richmond. So Richmond does have a higher percentage of black citizens than many other cities do. And that's a that's just a major factor in everything having to do with Richmond politics, culture, economics. And um, and as you may know, Richmond does not have the greatest history of dealing with its black citizens. Well, um, you know, <laughs> yep. yes, we are. We are in the former Confederacy here. So that is definitely just something for people to keep in mind as you're talking about the challenges facing your school, because classical education has been really, really white. Right. Yep. So that's exactly right. And we, the first key to ex accessibility is proximity. So in God's mm -hmm. providence, we are proximate to neighborhoods that are white, black, and, mm -hmm. and some of the more mixed neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. So we're in position. We're, we're in position to serve more families. Proximity matters because of transportation. Richmond has a not so good history in terms of transportation and how we divided up the city where people could um, get around. So we we want to be, we're close enough to different communities where it's possible for students to get here. So proximity matters. If you're thinking about another context, as we think about classical education broadly, then we think about works like Kevin Clark down in Florida with the Ecclesia schools. 
doing pocket smaller schools in different neighborhoods that are just all very local. So there are multiple ways to slice it. But for us, we're a big brick and mortar school in Richmond. So that's the, the first thing is we have to be near near neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And then we have to make the school accessible financially because there are part of that, part of part of serving the whole community, serving families that don't come from the same socioeconomic background. That may also coincide with ethnicity, but it doesn't. It's it's everything. So mm-hmm. there are lots of kinds of people who wouldn't naturally think Veritas Classical School is a perfect fit for me. Uh, maybe it's too white. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe it's too... Well, we have to... We have to part of it is messaging and saying, no, it's actually accessible. Um, here's here's mm-hmm. how and here's why it's accessible. But you, you have to get out in the neighborhood and meet people and tell that story and, 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 bring, and bring them in. So part of it is the posture toward the community. The community and those who don't think they would be a fit need to mm-hmm. know and need to believe that you want them. I, I do feel like that the classical school movement does tend to be more focused on the suburbs which is, yeah. you know, people in the suburbs need classical schools too. I get that. But you've got you've got a particularly interesting opportunity there in terms of making yourself just proximate to the, the populations that otherwise might not find you. Exactly. And w- one of the interesting things is because we've said we want to matter, we want Veritas to matter to Richmond because Richmond matters to Veritas. And we've mm-hmm. we've talked about being committed to the city and the common good of the city. When we moved to the north side, I think we had three families that were families of Veritas parents that lived in the north side. Now we have over 100. So families have mm-hmm. moved from the suburbs. We have walking, riding bikes to school. We have a very different kind of dynamic. And I don't want them just to move into the north side and just come to school here. We want them to be in the community. So our mm-hmm. families are, are and involved, want we want them to be involved in all, all of the efforts in and around the what we call the historic north side or Ginter Park. And we want them involved in the community organizations and the YMCA, service, mm-hmm. service opportunities, politics. Mm-hmm. We want them engaged, we want them to be engaged. And so <clears throat> most of the parents are choosing to do that and finding ways to be good neighbors on their own. But we also we also try to encourage that. As an administration, we encourage people to think that way. I'm really excited to uh put Alexandra Hudson's new book that's coming out next month, The Soul of Civility, into our folks' hands because she does a good treatment. A little bit of the Rosaria Butterfield gospel comes with a house key, but hospitality, loving your neighbor, friendship, front porching kinds of ideas. I think Veritas has to, we, what we have to do is look like we have a big front porch <laughs> and right. are, are welcoming and hospitable, not only to get them in, but then when they get here, how 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 do they feel? How comfortable do they feel? And so that's just something that's top of mind for us is what does it feel like for those who might feel uh, not as at home or not as comfortable because of the color of their skin or because of their economic background or because of their family situation? Right. And they're not they're not in a family where the mom can drop off this the mom or dad can drop off the kid in the morning and hang out for 30 minutes or 45 minutes and get to know other parents. Yep. How do we enfold those parents? So that accessibility crosses lots of different personal circumstances. But once you have that po- proximity and posture toward accessibility, you've really got to um, make it, you've got to have academic support. <laughs> As we talked mm-hmm. about earlier, we've already mentioned that. And then you've got to have a financial model where they can pay what they can afford. And so we have a tuition mm-hmm. assistance program where people pay what they can afford. To do that, you have to charge the right tuition. So mm-hmm. I don't like the word affordability. I like accessibility. Schools that say they want to make themselves affordable set the bar too low, set the tuition too low for everyone because they right. try to set they try to set a level that everyone can afford. Well, then there are a lot of people who can't afford more. So you that that's a tricky thing, but you got to get your tuition set right so that you can bring in more families and make a more beautiful school that has that can potentially have a hundred or two hundred more students than you would have otherwise. But mm-hmm. and they bring a lot of beauty to uh, to the school environment in lots of different ways. So that commitment, that commitment has to be to that commitment to accessibility from a brick and mortar school, depending no matter where you are, has to be really thought out uh, mm-hmm. and and attended to it 
there's a lot of, that needs to happen that won't just happen naturally. Yeah. And, and I'd say that, I mean, classical education at home can also be inaccessible because of work schedules, because of uh, parents. I mean, it. no matter how many times people tell you that you can homeschool, if you really feel completely inadequate, you're not going to enjoy this process. You know, you're mm-hmm. not going to do a good job because you're always going to be struggling with your own sense of, of failure. I, I have always said that not every family should homeschool. I'm a big fan of it. Not every family should homeschool. And, you know, and homeschooling families go through different seasons of their life where mm-hmm. they might want to put one child in school for a while, all the kids in school for a while. You know, when I we, I think I've told this story on previous episodes of this podcast. I can't remember, Susanna. But when my when my I've got four kids and when my youngest child was going into middle school, her mm-hmm. brother, who was closest to her in age, was getting ready to go off to college. And she'd been raised in this house with, you know, three rambunctious boys. She always had a brother to entertain her at any point. She just called them the brothers. They had this like, you know, <laughs> group name. And I thought all of a sudden this kid is going to be all by herself and it's just going to be her and it's just going to be me. And I don't think that's a good dynamic. Mm -hmm. So for middle school, we put her in a classroom. And then for high school, she was like, no, I want to come back home. But families go through that sort of, you know, dynamic where you need to have options that are not just you. And I would say that the proximity and the finances are probably the two things that tend to stand out as the biggest bars for homeschoolers investigating the the school options. Mm-hmm. So I I mean it it's kind of embarrassing sometimes but I think that if you're looking at a classical school one thing you should say is I'm not sure we can afford this. What are you going to do to help me here? You know, I'm sure that's yeah. your favorite question from parents coming in Keith, but it's got to be asked. Yeah, and, and we and we really try to beat them to the punch. Uh, I'd, I'd like for them to know by reading our website, by by hearing from our admissions people in the process. I I, w- I want that to be. I want our our invitation to be clear that we want to, to admit missionally of aligned families across the socio economic spectrum. And so I I would I would hope that that a good number of our families would would have a sense of our commitment to that before they had to ask. But, and then we talk about the process and as well, and there's, there's plenty for them to ask and what does, exactly does that look like? But mm-hmm. we, we definitely want them to not, to, to not disqualify themselves unnecessarily or be afraid to ask the question that, that would not be the, that would not be hospitable. That would not be front porching the way we would like to. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it's good to hear. And I hope listeners take away that there are all of these options. You know, homeschooling works great for some families, but there are also schools, maybe a school nearby that wants to welcome you and wants to work with you. And that's so good to hear. Moving into the sort of broader picture of classical education um, spreading in the in the bigger world, making it more accessible and more available, my Next question is more, how do homeschools, non-traditional schools and, and, and brick and mortar schools help out there with growing classical education more generally? Well, I mean, I definitely think that homeschool, homeschool gives you the opportunity to really pioneer something, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, when we, when I, when I started home educating my kids back in mm, 93, you know, whenever my, my oldest was reaching kindergarten age, the, the whole genesis of the well-trained mind was that I knew I wanted to homeschool. You know, we're a farm family. That's, that's a big part of homeschooling for us was just all the kids were engaged on the farm. Um, but I wanted to give them the same kind of classical education that my mother had created for us. Mm-hmm. And so the genesis of the well-trained mind was me saying, all right, let's make a plan, not just for us, but for other people who want to do this. Mm. And um, I, 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 I'm going to say this with some caution. I called Doug Wilson, who was one of the granddaddies of championing the classical school pattern. And I say that with some caution because Doug Wilson's cultural views to me are have become somewhat extreme and I don't want to identify with them. So but I was talking about education, not about his views on women say. Um, so I called him and I said, you know, I, I've read Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning, which was this mm-hmm. little tract he'd written about the pattern. Uh, this is how I was. I want to write a guide to homeschooling. <laughs> and I remember his exact words well were, OK, good luck with that. I don't <laughs> think it's going to work, but go for it. 
right? I, I mean, because he was very, I mean, because he had a traditional bricks and mortar school. Right. And so, but I was like, well, this is what I want to do. So we wrote The Well-Trained Mind and it really did pioneer a new way of thinking about homeschool at a time when homeschool was very much a Becca um, mm, yeah. or, or, or correspondent to University of Nebraska Lincoln. You know, those mm-hmm. these were kind of your options. And uh, so homeschooling, I think, just has this huge role in saying, let's try something different. I'm the parent. I'm taking responsibility for it. I'm sensitive to my kid. I'll make sure that they're doing OK. Let's see what can work, which is something that I think a bricks and mortar school doesn't have the same kind of freedom to do. Right. So, I mean, that's that's where I see homeschooling as being a, a an important part of making classical education accessible is just finding innovative ways to do things. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, the homeschooling growth has been unbelievable, but but so has uh, so has conventional or brick and mortar and brick and mortar. Not exactly the best word. I have a brick and mortar school, I guess. I guess if you meet in a building, but a lot of our folks meet in rented buildings and temporary buildings, and mm-hmm. it doesn't have the permanence mm-hmm. that, that you really think of in brick and mortar. Yeah. And it, mm-hmm. I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago when we had just moved to this campus 10 years ago, and I was thinking about really enjoying the fruits of how this school and my other school had come together. And my mind really was on replicating more schools like this. And mm-hmm. I was... And I really hadn't thought about, and I was a champion of homeschooling. I never talk anyone out of homeschooling. If that's the, if you want to classically homeschool, I say, great. My wife and I were just too scared to do that. So we thought we'd get involved in a startup school and, and end up leading one ourselves. It felt easier to me than homeschooling myself, but I'm a champion of those who stay home to do it. But uh, I remember it was actually uh, with uh, uh, the, the now president of the University of Florida at the time, a U.S. senator, or he, maybe he was about to be a senator at the time. But he, he's the first one who said, Keith, there are, there are going to be very few Veritas in the, in the next mm-hmm. couple of decades, meaning full on brick and mortar schools that are owned, the capital outlay, the expenses there's going to be an explosion of a bunch of different kinds of schools. And that's the first time I just started thinking more broadly about micro schools. Uh, There's a, Mm -hmm. there's a a board I serve on with that I didn't mention earlier with a guy who's trying to do micro pod schools in the Northwest. Uh, Kevin Mm -hmm. Clark, I already mentioned, I think for classical education to explode, it's going to be smaller and way more decentralized. That being said, we need flagship schools across the country, Veritas and many others to be healthy to be sustainable, because I think we provide a platform to be of great service to pods, micro schools, startup schools. I talked about our desire to be more accessible in Richmond, but there are two school, two classical schools or classically oriented school, liberal arts schools in Richmond, Elijah House Academy and Mago Day that are fantastic. And they're serving under-resourced populations in ways that I haven't been able to do or figure out. Well, we want to be a blessing to the schools like that. And I think flagship schools can do a lot. We can bring in speakers. We can bring in guests that can be a service to, mm-hmm. for faculty training and things like that. We can have a physical campus that some of them can have to host things. So uh, so my mind has really shifted. I want to build my school here, what I know to do. I don't know how to do those other models of schools, but I want to be a champion of leaders who have visions different visions to make it more accessible, whether it's Rafiki in Africa or uh, the Ecclesia schools in Florida. I think I think we're going to see many more expressions of that. And, and we just have to champion those and figure out what part can we play in resourcing and champion, as well as building up our mm-hmm. own institutions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, you know, I've been making some notes as we go along about uh, about questions to ask if you're visiting a classical school. So that's kind of, I kind of want to wrap up with that. But be- before I sort of, I'll go through my list of questions, Keith, and see if there's any that you want to add, you can put on your parent hat for a minute. Let's actually, before we do that, maybe talk about some red flags if you're visiting a classical school, if you're looking into it. And I just want to kick off and say that when, since I brought up, you know, putting my putting my youngest into into middle school, we um, did not put her in a classical school because the one that was possible for us to get to, which was not yours, Keith, we decided Veritas was too much of a hike oh. for us. We could not be part of the community. The one that we visited had a distinct lack of joy 
to <laughs> it. Um, I mean, obviously there was, you know, there was great academic achievement going on, but I walked in and there was a rigidity. There was a, um, there was a programmed aspect to it mm. that I could not see working for my, you know, previously homeschooled child who used to start her days by running out barefoot to walk on the top of the barn roof. I just didn't think that was going to work. Right. So would, would you say that that's a thing to look out for? Yeah, that um, when I first thought about this question, that was my number one. I would look for what makes me happy every day. And we've got a lot of refining to do. We have a lot of work to do. We're not a, we're, we're, we have not arrived at Veritas. We have high aspirations. But when I walk through my hallways onto the quad and I see our students are at a soccer game, um, I think I think I think across the board, parents, teachers, students would say it feels like a joy filled place feels like a happy mm -hmm. place, not to a person. You can find the person sulking off in the corner mad about this or that. <laughs> but in, in a sense, do you find it? So if you walk onto a campus and it just seems the kids aren't uh, happy, not in a student serve, not in a student centered way where the students have the run of the place. You want this appropriate decorum. I'm looking for some decorum. I'm looking for how students interact with adults when I'm visiting the campus. That's one of the biggest things we see. How do students... And I'm looking for two things. I'm looking to see students engage with adults respectfully, but sincerely, not like they were made to do it. Like they have been told mm, right. to do it, but they actually like the person that they're crossing and smiling at and saying, hello, Mr. Nix. And so right. that's a big part of it for me. And I think you'll hit on a second part too. I think in well-intentioned ways, in the early days when we were trying to prove ourselves as classical schools, that we, we valued rigor that ended up looking like rigidity because we wanted to prove ourselves academically. We were out there in a yeah. hostile world and we realized we did it. We, you know, we were, uh, we were, we were uh, boiling the baby and it's home milk kind of thing. We were overly, uh, it was, it, it got too hot. It was too intense. Mm. Any schools will tell that story that they were really piling it on too hard in trying to prove themselves. So I'd look for a pace of life whether they use the word scole or not, I would look at how long lunch periods are. If they're if they're trying to maximize every minute of the day and moving from class to class with bell with bells in a Pavlovian way um, and have a short lunch to eat as fast as they can to get onto the thing, that's a red flag to me. What does leisure look like on your campus? What does outside time look like? How how often kids, are the kids outside? Can the teachers call audibles and go out whenever they feel like they need to versus being on some, oh, not recess time yet. The teacher, the artist in the classroom knows when recess needs to happen better than anyone. So what does right. that look like is a big, a big thing for me. I tell every school to get rid of any automatic buzzing bells, but, um, mm. but I do love at the end of our 45 minute or 50 minute lunch period, we ring a real bell, like a little jingle and all the students. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Yeah, it's a very humane kind of bell. And the students gather under the big oak tree, all the upper school students, and sing the doxology and reframe themselves before they go back into the class. There's a feeling about that that's not rushed. It's not hurried. Mm -hmm. uh, do some of our students feel like school is too much and rushed and hurried? I'm sure it does. Sure. But but it's something I would want to know the school is thinking in, those lang in that language. I would also ask the school about discipline. Mm -hmm. And you, mm -hmm. you kind of want to see a smile on their face, not a, oh, here, here's who, who's in charge of discipline or here's our policy or rule book. But you want them to talk about discipline as this big opportunity to get, get at the hearts of kids. Mm -hmm. Discipline is an opportunity to, to know our kids in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise and to point them to Christ and see rest, repentance and restoration so most schools assign, and especially most public schools or independent schools, like that's the low end. That's the job that nobody wants. You've got student discipline where we right, think it's right. the good stuff. That, that's, right. that it's the good stuff. And so those interruptions because kids sin and teachers sin and administrators sin. And because we sin and we mess up, those interruptions are beautiful places to do the real work that we're trying to do in mm. forming souls, not just filling minds. So I would ask about that. I would look at I would look for an overemphasis on the athletics. I like athletics done well. I like them to talk about a, a, the gymna gymnastics with a K, gymnastique, the idea of embodied learning, that our bodies are a part of that. I'd want to hear them talk about that. I'd want a big emphasis on the arts, even with little resources. Show me you care about it. 
show me you care about the mm-hmm. visual and performing arts and musical arts. Uh, when there's a lack of that, I'm, I'm a bit concerned, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. even even if it's aspirational. Boy, mm-hmm. I wish we could afford. Yep. We do this little bit of thing. We have a small choir. When I got to Veritas, that existed. There was a small choir. That was it. But the way they talked about the music program, we have 100 plus, maybe 120 students in our strings program now. It is massive. I remember when we had one or two, but we had a visionary, a champion of the strings with aspiration. So I want to talk, I I want to hear the school talk aspirationally, even if they're not well resourced yet about, Mm. about the arts. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and then I think something we've touched on that I think is worth emphasizing as we sort of come to the, come to the end here is I I think I would ask about the financial model, right? Um, Is because this is part of finding out if the school is in a healthy place. I I know you had mentioned earlier, uh, Keith, that some of the schools, some schools try to make themselves accessible by keeping tuition artificially low, but that means something important is being squeezed somewhere else. Yeah, that's right. So I would, I would ask about the financial model and philosophy of the school. Let them articulate it. You'll know pretty quickly if there are schools just scraping by trying to pay the bills and not paying their teachers enough. You, that won't be hard to identify. You you want to hear more a more well thought out philosophy about understanding the real cost of running a school while paying a fair wage. Okay, what are those costs? And, and I would. Say- yeah, I mean, I would say just from from my experience with schools and then also from a parent's point of view, if you go if you walk into a school and every single teacher there is in their first or second year of teaching and I have seen that, that's a red flag because they are right. not paying a wage that allows grown people with families to have a stable life and and a constant turnover of young employees who then have to leave when they start a family because they can't afford to do it anymore is just a recipe for instability. It is. So asking for a trip faculty and student attrition mm-hmm. rates is mm-hmm. um, yeah. is a key is a key data point yeah if they're running lots of small fundraisers I, we help schools you know we do one we do one annual fund a year we ask our parents unless we're in a capital campaign we're asking our families to give on top of tuition one time a year but we're not selling stuff we're not having our kids sell stuff we're not scraping and yep. mm-hmm. we're, we're running our school basically off tuition and we're raising money to do enhancements, enrichments, things our families want. They're not core or necessary. That extra but we could get a couple of years out of that extra bus. Uh, we could keep moving the physical goals in the gym in and out every day, or we could install some that come down. So you can you mm-hmm. we use fundraising for things that we want, but not core operations. Definitely not compensation. We want our compensation problem solved with the right tuition. So that's easier said than done. I get it. But over the years, we've helped many, many schools move to that model and get healthier financially, which is good for everyone. So as we wrap up here, then, as we've been going on, I've, I've made a list of 10 questions to ask when you're visiting your local classical school. So let me run awesome. through those and then you can you can add any suggestions that we'll have to footnote you, Keith. This is yeah. Keith's list. <laughs> Uh, you're visiting, you're going to ask all of these things. Number one, how do you adapt for students who come in at different levels or who are on different developmental paths? What what strategies do you have in place for that? How do you make sure that students are known by your teachers and by your administration? What's your strategy for making sure that they don't disappear, that, that they are present and acknowledged? Number three, can we talk to a family or two that was new here last year. I just have this vision of this one family that had a good experience yeah. <laughs> fielding all of these questions, right? Yeah. Number four, how can I afford this school? And what is your, what's your financial model? And as part of that, you sort of have a red flag out if it looks like they do a zillion small fundraisers, particularly if those fall on the students and the parents every year. Number five, how often are they go outside? <laughs> When do they go outside? What's recess like? Do teachers have, you know, do the teachers have that? Where are the breaks and how much how much power do the teachers have over those breaks? And I would say, too, that the younger children are the more important. That that's just absolutely vital. Right. Yep. Uh, six. What's the philosophy of discipline? And then I think I would I, from what you were saying, Keith, I'd wait and see if they produce a rule book or if they actually yeah. give you a <laughs> an Amen. answer to that. Exactly. Yep. All right. Seven. What's the emphasis on athletics? And, and I think maybe that's another one where you just sort of wait and s- hear what they say because you don't want them thinking, oh, this person really wants an athletic team, so I'll talk it up. You want to actually hear what the real place of athletics in the school is. Uh, eight, 
Um, how much attention are you are you giving to the arts? And what are your aspirations for the future? Because I hear you saying that that's a bit of a developmental thing, particularly with a smaller school. I think maybe a lot of times you're waiting for the right person to come along. Yep. Yep. That's good. Nine. What are your faculty attrition rates? How many people have you had here who've been here for 10 years or more? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good and, nine. And then 10. What are your student attrition rates? Mm. Yeah. It's a great list. I would add just one or two. I would ask how the governance is structured in the school and how does the board relate to the head? So what we're having in classical education right now is a lot of schools moving out of the early founding era of a board, which is a working Mm -hmm. board, which they tend to be too operational. And the boards Mm -hmm. have their hands in the operations, personnel, curriculum, annual budget, uh, all kinds of things that should be under just their single employee, the head of school. And a lot of schools know that now. A lot of schools 10 years ago, 15 years ago, didn't know they should be doing better. Mm-hmm. I think we've spent the last decade tell, telling them that. So yeah, that, I'd want to know if they have that understanding or if, they're st- or if they still have a governing body that's running the school versus a I, hired executive leader, head of school that really is, is their sole employee. I know we're keeping you for a really long time, Keith. I promise we'll let you go shortly. But I, I would, and I, this depends too how far in the weeds you want to get. Maybe you don't want to ask all these questions on your first visit, but if you're right. thinking of enrolling, you know, definitely some things to dig into. Yep. From my own experience on nonprofit boards, a lot of institutions go through this switch from what's called a founders board, where there's a visionary that starts this thing and everybody that's on the board is one of their friends or relations. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then you go through a transition where it gets big enough to where other outside influences need to come in. And that's a necessary and often messy transition that nonprofit organizations make. And sometimes it can cause a lot of chaos in the institution itself. So if you don't want to get caught in that chaos, one useful question to ask is who's on the board and how many of them are related to the founder? You know, it's just sometimes it can help you gauge the institution's maturity. That's all. Mm. It's yeah, that's a very good one. Yes. Uh, uh, Dan, did you you said a couple of things? Was that that was the governance? So, so governance, else? yeah, governance is and how how the board relates to the head of school. Yeah, I think that's it. I think the on the the only we're we've gotten to the point where we do, don't do letter or numeric grades K through six. That's not what our assessment looks like. I'm not saying every school should be there. It's a hard thing to pull off, but grades are a modern invention in the history of education. Yeah. And they're largely 100%. poor. So I would say I wouldn't knock a school for having them, but I would sure want to know how they think about that. And, right. and, and I want them to recognize how progressive this, the, the whole idea of grading came from and what its limits are and how they're working to focus on habits of the heart and mind and not just new, not just letter and number grades. Not just letter and number grades. That is a really, really good point. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, one last question, Keith. Uniforms sure. or no uniforms? Uniforms for me. Yep. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us why? Well, I think there are a couple, three things. I think that once it becomes part of the culture of your school, every, every student is going to go through a phase where they like it or not. But it simplifies yeah. it simplifies their life. They're getting ready in the morning. My daughter, who's an artist, who likes to dress like flamboyantly, you know, when she chooses, Mm -hmm. she actually liked having a uniform because she just, it took that decision-making out of her morning routine. I'll just put on what I'm supposed to put on. Um, So that the simplicity of that, when it comes to accessibility, I went, my kids, before we started the the classical school that was started in Birmingham that, that we jumped on board with early, but our kids had been at a large Christian school that didn't have uniforms. And you just knew who was really rich and who was barely hanging on. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it when you talk about hospitality and accessibility, it evens the playing Mm -hmm. field. And third is distraction. When we have when we have those occasional jeans days or free dress days, there is a decorum in the students and in the classroom that changes a bit. And so I think Mm -hmm. it's better for teachers in limiting the distractions they're managing. If you don't have uniforms, you're probably going to need a dress code. Dress code has more variation. Teachers have have to manage that variation. Oh yeah, and that could be a nightmare. <laughs> nightmare. So nightmare. I'm pro you. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Keith, and for all of your insights. We're really glad that you could come on. 
Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Got to be on on a Zoom on a call uh, podcast with a hero, so that's great for me. Good, good day. <laughs> Awesome. Well, for those of you uh, listening, please subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. We would also love to hear from you, your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, or any kind of education that interests you. You can reach us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. Hi, it's Susanna here with a quick end of episode note. As we're thinking about wrapping season one, we're going to have 12 episodes total in this season. We just want to give a huge thank you to everyone for supporting the very first season of this podcast, for subscribing, for reviewing, for sending us emails and suggestions. We really appreciate you so much. It has truly made the experience of starting a podcast rewarding, and we're looking forward to many more seasons to come. To thank you for your support, we are offering a 20% off coupon for the Well-Trained Mind store that will run from today, November 8th, 2023, to November 15th, 2023. And that code is in all caps, W-T-M-P-O-D. That's W-T-M-P-O-D. It'll work for items on our online store at welltrainedmind.com. Thank you so much for your support throughout season one of the Well-Trained Mind podcast. I will link all this information in the show notes. Have a great day.